Hi everybody, Rad Mom here. Welcome back to the garden on a lovely summer evening where tonight we're going to be asking the big questions. What is femininity? Which I think is a question feminism ought to be answering, don't you? Really quickly though, please like the video if you enjoy my content and subscribe to the channel so we can all work together to bring feminism back into the real world. Um, tonight we're going to be dealing with literature because that's one of the most important ways in which we reflect our ideas and ideals about the real world, right? Humans are storytellers. We're going to be exploring the idea of true love as a feminine ideal through the literary characters of Snow White and Samantha Jones. With the help of Manisha from Baggage Claim, if anybody watches that channel, she uh, kind of runs in some conservative circles. I don't necessarily agree with the way she approaches talking about this actress. Rachel Ziegler, the 22-year-old actress cast as the new Snow White, has clearly been doing a bang-up job promoting her upcoming role as the fairest of them all. And she's a very young woman, clearly, who, I don't know if everybody knows this because nobody else has mentioned this yet, actually lost her job over this. You know, so it's not a joke. It wasn't funny to begin with, but, you know, they canceled, like, an entire series of movies apparently because of the things this girl said uh the way that it went viral actually and it made the company look bad because she did not appreciate the gravity of the ip that she'd been handed right this is their first animated feature okay it's not just old it is the oldest uh and that means something to them like brand wise okay internationally so they weren't too happy with being made look stupid in a viral video of hers. So she actually had her sequel canceled and apparently this entire pantheon of stuff that was going to happen is no longer going to happen and a lot of people lost a lot of potential work because of this. But you know, what the hell did she say anyway? Let's see what she has to say about the first ever Disney princess. I just mean that it's no longer 1937 and we absolutely wrote a Snow White she's that is- She's not gonna be yeah, saved by the prince. She's not gonna be saved by the prince and she's not gonna be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. She was coached to say this stuff and she riffed on it a little too much, as we shall see. And this is Gal Gadot trying to keep her on script already. So, tell me, Rachel, what exactly is wrong with dreaming about true love? I mean, you know, the, the original cartoon came out in 1937, yeah. and very evidently so. <laughs> um, there is a big focus on her love story um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Yeah, weird. Super weird. So we didn't do that this time. <laughs> so, no, so no prince or a different kind of prince? We have a different approach to what I'm sure a lot of people will assume is a love story just because like we cast a guy in the movie, right. Andrew Burnap, great dude. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those things that I think everyone's going to have their assumptions about what it's actually going to be, but uh, it's really not about the love story at all, which is really, really wonderful. And whether or not she finds love along the way is anybody's guess until 2024. Um, all of Andrew's scenes could get cut. Who knows? I don't mean to comment on what she's wearing, but I'm going to comment on what she's wearing because this is a mini dress in the shape of a corset over a man-style button-up shirt. Right? That's an interesting choice. And if you look closely, the two fabrics are both black and white, but they are different patterns, so they clash. Like, she's saying the same thing with her clothes that she's saying with her words. So, the message could not be clearer, but I think it's a sort of ironically feminine way of sending that message. And since she was coached on what to say, she probably didn't pick what she wore either. I was scared of the original cartoon. I think I watched it once and then I never picked it up again. <laughs> like, I'm being so serious. I so you're not familiar with this film? The one that you were just criticizing? Forgive me, I'm not an actress. But I would think that if I were handed the lead role in anything that was a remake of a classic, I would immediately go and watch that classic. I mean, you know, just due diligence and whatever. Never revisited Snow White again. Wow, she really doesn't like Snow White, does she? It's Hollywood, baby. Look, no hatred towards this young actress. Are we buying that? You're being awfully snotty here. 
who's doing her very best to be the new Jennifer Lawrence. I have not talked to Jennifer Lawrence, but if she wants to call me, she can. we can hang out anytime. I'm obsessed with her. I love her so much. Okay, that's legitimately adorable though, right? She's a fangirl too, just like everyone else. At her age, it's commonplace for people to parrot the various ideas that they've been inundated with. And patronizing her isn't helping anything. By gender studies professors and liberal arts students posing as Hollywood writers. And you know, this snide implication that they're not really writers. Like, you can be a writer and still believe this stuff. All of whom strongly believe that women shouldn't be graceful, demure, gentle, modest, cooperative, and least of all, interested in marriage or motherhood. That's quite a list. Can we unpack that at some point? So basically, according to these writers, women should not be like Snow White. After all, she represents all of those things. That's true. <laughs> Snow White represents a feminine ideal, right? Ideals are unrealistic by their very nature. And let's not forget her great propensity to do housework, which honestly just makes feminists lose their mind. And I object to this usage of the word feminist. That's a pretty broad brush you're painting with there. So I have two questions. First, why does modern representation of female stories have to be devoid of love. That love should not be seen as an ideal is kind of a new idea, right? And second, if Snow White is such an antiquated and irrelevant character, why is it that after 211 years, we still talk about the character? Why do little girls dress up like her? And why have there been so many adaptations of her story? Because she represents a feminine ideal and the evil queen represents the antithesis of that. They are foils of one another you highlight one another's opposite qualities and it's an excellent piece of work in that way okay it's like allegorical uh, of issues that you know women deal with in the original story the evil queen is her real mother which i think changes the dynamic quite a bit to understand this, I went back and read the original Brothers Grimm fairy tale, as well as watched the 1937 movie, and I could completely understand the impulse to criticize her. Snow White is shown to be achingly naive, and in her own story, pretty passive. But is this a fair representation of the story? No, but I'll explain that later. Because first, we need to talk about the true modern day princess. And no, I don't mean Jasmine, Belle, Ariel, or even Meghan Markle. I mean, Samantha Jones. Hello. It's over. I told my wife. Who is this? She is funny. I'm less familiar, frankly, with Sex in the City than I am with Snow White. Aw, uh, because I never could get into it. Like, no one ever mentions. I swear it's the first episode. Samantha here is upset because her latest fuckboy secretly videotapes the models that he has sex with as art. That's his art. And the people in the show take this shit seriously, okay? And she's ticked off at him because he doesn't want to film her since she's not a model. That is the plot of this episode. That's her character arc. In, I swear to God, the first episode of the show? How on earth does anyone get through that? I, how do y'all watch this stuff? I don't get it. Since her television debut back in 1998, Samantha Jones has dominated as a feminist icon. And while the wokeness wave has ravaged the once adored characters of Carrie Bradshaw, Charlotte York, and even Miranda Hobbs, Samantha has had staying power thanks to her cheeky lines and unapologetic confidence. I'm a trisexual. I'll try anything once. And I want to point out that the original story Sex in the City was based on were supposed to be satire i'm pretty sure of this i wrote a blog post about it you can find a link to it down in the description below samantha's independence and affluence has made her incredibly attractive to feminists everywhere she's a powerful high earner that never needs to take any crap and with her voracious sexual appetite complete disinterest in emotional connection with men and general disdain for children samantha is the ultimate counterforce to the patriarchy common criticisms of the patriarchy include the fact that men run the world and as such want to keep women out of powerful positions and lock them into marriages where they can be effectively subjugated by their husbands. I'm sorry, I thought this was the problem. Why are we mocking this idea? Is this not the truth? What are you talking about? So dreaming of love is bad. 
because it's akin to yearning for a man, yearning to be made whole by another person, yearning to be rescued by a man, and in doing so, handing over all of your power. Dreaming of love is yearning for your own subjugation. This sort of media is the kind of stuff that embeds that idea, right? Because, like, have you met young girls? Have you met women? Like, who the fuck do you think consumes romance media? What is a chick flick? I mean, come on. Are we just going to pretend that, you know, true love isn't some sort of feminine ideal? You know, it's an ideal. It's unattainable. Okay, that's the whole point. It's to orient you in the direction you want to go. Right? You never actually fucking reach it. It's like the horizon. The Samantha Jones feminist perspective is that it is wrong to need anyone. Which is absurd. We live in a society? What the fuck is this? This is infantile. We're a social species. We cluster together in groups, like instinctively, to help one another out. That's what civilization is. That's what the resulting melting pot of ideas births all of our wonderful technology that we love so much. Like, I'm not saying that isn't what Samantha Jones is arguing. I'm saying that that's nonsense. But pretending that the issues it's reacting to are imaginary solves nothing. What's interesting, though, is that over the six-season run of the show and the two movies that followed, Samantha has two instances of what she might call weakness, where she truly craves the love of a man. The first comes when she is sick with the flu and realizes that the various men in her life that she engages in casual sex with are only interested in, surprise, surprise, coming over for casual sex. Like, these are moments of weakness. We don't have to put quotation marks around that. We, have, we all have moments of weakness. We all sometimes need someone to help us, don't we? This should not be a revolutionary statement. This leads her to make a shocking revelation. I should have gotten married. It doesn't matter how much you have. If you don't have a guy who cares about you, it don't mean shit. Okay, because she's a straight woman, right? But like, you could just replace that with if you don't have someone who cares about you. And all of your wealth is meaningless. I'm sorry, this is a tale as old as time. Literally, it's called King Midas. Right? All the gold in the world wasn't worth the life of his fucking daughter. That's the moral of the story. Which is from like ancient Mesopotamia. Okay? <laughs> this is not new. This has inverted that moral. <laughs> but when she's back on her feet, she quickly rejects that notion of needing anyone. Second time that Samantha needed the support of a man. This time when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And here, Smith is actually willing to take care of her. But some years later, when she's fighting fit again, Samantha escapes out of that relationship. And she didn't learn a damn thing. Because hers is a villain arc? I don't know. That's a villain arc where like, they're shown this lesson and they refuse to learn it over and over again. I don't make this stuff up. I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> what does that tell you? I don't know. This is a classical lesson. Literally. I don't. <sighs> this is basic human stuff. I love you, but I love me more. And commits herself to her bachelorhood. Can you imagine if everyone said that to everyone else? I love you, but I love me more. Fuck off. I have no devotion to you. This is toxic shit. Samantha's frustration with relationships, a frustration that the anti-love feminists share, is the necessity to compromise. I have no real connection to our life here. And my managing you. It's, it's getting to be too much. I'm starting to resent it. For the last two years, it's been all about you. Well, for the first three years, it was all about you. I know. That was so much more fun. Ew. I cannot imagine making my relationship about myself for three straight years. This is some toxic shit. To make any relationship work, there is a level of compromise necessary from both parties. Like compromise of time, independence, and a change in priorities. Fun fact, sometimes you have to compromise with yourself. Like, compromise is a fact of life. You cannot escape that. But to postmodern feminists and to Samantha, this translates to giving up power. And it's this obsession with power that dictates that women should not wish for love, but rather look to lead. And I want to point out again that this is accepting a masculine image of power and authority. What does a feminine image of power and authority look like? I don't fucking know, do you? 
This is yet another criticism of the original Snow White story for not orienting women everywhere to seek out leadership. The reality is that the cartoon was made 85 years ago and therefore it's extremely dated when it comes to the ideas of women being in roles of power and uh, and what a woman is fit for in the world. And so when we came to reimagining the actual role of Snow White, it became about the fairest of them all, meaning who is the most just. <laughs> a pun, how nice. And the reality is, you know, Snow White has to learn a lot of lessons about coming into her own power before she can come into power over a kingdom. But hey, they forgot that it was the queen and not the king that has all the power in the original story. Thank you, which is what makes this a female story, right? Because it's a, you know, a representation of a toxic mother-daughter dynamic, which is important to be able to discuss. And this brings us to what I think is actually the biggest problem the feminists have with Snow White, the evil queen. The modern proclamations on female representation absolutely forbids negative representation of women, especially of women in power. So no doubt, in the newest installment, her evilness will be explained away and justified by being caused by some man that oppressed her and didn't accept her for who she is and thus made her insecure about aging. And I don't think that this is specific to female villains either. Lately, we just have a whole pantheon of sympathetic villains. It's just kind of the thing we're doing lately. And it's kind of annoying, honestly. Like, please don't give the evil queen a sympathetic backstory. Please don't do that. We don't... She doesn't need it. She's one of the few characters that through the years has managed to remain pretty much unchanged. Like the girl said, it's been 80 whatever years. You know, don't fix what's not broken. This is the modern approach, you guys. All female problems are directly caused by men. Which again, it would be really nice if we could talk about which problems are caused by men and how, because some of them are, right? Uh, but we're not allowed to talk about our relationships with men in feminism. So the movie will probably end with some speech from Snow White that will melt the evil queen's heart and the two of them will link hands and unleash their wrath on the real villain of the story, a man. And there you have it, the modern take on Snow White that will really just be a propagandist lecture and a massive talking down to for men and women everywhere. It will lose money at the box office and the creators and actors will blame the racist and sexist nature of audiences as a justification for their failure. I'm pretty sure it's going to lose money at the box office because they're probably not going to promote it like they would have uh, if they hadn't canceled everything. So if we go back to the real story of Snow White, what exactly do Snow White and the evil queen signify? Well, the queen represents the perils of vanity, or let's use the more appropriate term for it, narcissism. And Snow White's ability to dethrone her as the fairest of them all is not about Snow White's youthful allure. It's because of her inner beauty. Her empathy. She's the antithesis of the selfish, aging, vain, narcissistic mother figure. This is why the mirror tells the queen that she has to eat Snow White's heart. The queen tries to take that literally, but again, that's symbolic of what makes Snow White beautiful. It's not her flesh, it's her heart. What about her makes her the fairest of them all? It's her spirit. Even in the darkest of times, it's her ability to pull herself together and her willingness to see the good around her. And when she comes across a place of possible safety, her first instinct is to start cleaning it. Again, many people will see this as a patriarchal brainwashing attempt to convince young girls everywhere to start cooking and cleaning. But I see this as her desire to do her part, to make her corner of this earth beautiful. You know, this really hit me. I don't know about making their corner of the world beautiful, but lest we forget, dust, grime, living in squalor is bad for you. So dusting, cleaning, picking stuff up, this is maintaining your home as a healthy environment. It is essentially helpful. It's not necessarily a feminine thing, but a lot of women do end up doing this work because guess what? Women are the only ones who can have the babies and the babies really don't travel well so you end up being home a lot and you know I think this is a big part of what it is Snow White is also a representation of the value of women's work and erasing that is a mistake to take pride in where she is when she sees work that needs doing she takes it on and looks to earn her keep in the safety of someone else's home rather than just expecting shelter 
for nothing. And this is what makes everyone around her love her so much and want to do anything to help her, to protect her and save her. It's Snow White's goodness that emboldens the dwarves to fight and destroy the powerful queen. And dare I say it, a feminine representation of leadership and authority? Influence, certainly. You know, just a thought. But these are the qualities that the New Age feminists cannot appreciate because they, like the evil queen, are consumed by their vanity and desire for power. Yeah, because if Samantha Jones is your ideal, that is an inverted, you know, moral that's been understood for a very long time. So, you know, the fact that they <laughs> might relate to the villain of the piece starts to make some sense, I think. So how could they ever understand, let alone appreciate, the true value of Snow White? I want to point out that Snow White and Sex in the City are two very different kinds of stories. You know, Snow White is allegorical, as I've said. It's, she's not meant to be, you know, a realistic sort of character. She's an archetype. She is an ideal. Uh, whereas Samantha Jones is supposed to be a bit more grounded in reality. One of these, you know, stories is a lot older. It's a folk tale, right? And the other is a modern television show. So they're two very different kinds of stories, and they present two very different perspectives on the female experience. What is femininity? What are feminine ideals? Just inverting ancient truths doesn't make you smart. It's edgelord shit. This is feminism? I submit that it is not. But. Who the hell is anyone to know unless we jump in and keep this conversation going? This young woman had no idea what the fuck she was talking about. And I don't know, maybe they didn't do a terrifically good job of coaching her because she went off script quite a bit. And I can't believe somebody didn't sit her down and have her watch the damn movie. <laughs> what is that? And and please, in the tell me in the comments, what do you think the femininity is? Because it is a wide open field, apparently. Thank you so much for joining me out here in the garden on this lovely summer night to uh, compare and contrast Snow White and Samantha Jones. <laughs> Two completely opposite ways of dealing with the same question. Please like the video if you did and subscribe to the channel so that we can all work together to bring feminism back into the real world because gosh do we need it. And join me at noon for the live stream and discussion and look down below for a link where you can get a t-shirt to support the Rad Mom channel and I will see y'all next time. If anybody is looking forward to the Angelica ASMR video, I apologize. Um, apparently Aunt Flo forgot her bags. So, I was tired this week, and this just, this girl got fired. I don't know. I kind of think this is a big deal <laughs> as far as, you know, literary culture is concerned. So, uh, thank you so much for joining me, and we'll have Angelica ASMR next week, I promise. It's going to be a little bit more of an in-depth video. So... We'll see what we get. <laughs> Bye.